When you read the title of the Wild West, what was the first image or picture that came to your mind? Mm -hmm. Cowboys and Indians? Mm -hmm. You ever pretend you were a cowboy? Most boys at least have a cowboy hat growing up. Some have the whole get-up boots, holster, everything, bolo tie. Does this fit your idea of a cowboy? He looks really young, doesn't he? But tough. Let's take a look at what he wears. His pullover shirt doesn't look like a cowboy shirt that you might have. It is, uh, has just a few buttons. It's made of cotton, flannel, or wool. This is a slicker. It was worn to keep the cowboy dry in the rain and snow. It was made of oil cloth, and it was split in the back for use while riding and walking. And then we have the bandana that was sometimes used as a mask to keep out the dust. Sometimes the cowboy would stuff it into his hat to insulate his head from the sun. It could also be used as a tourniquet in case of snake bites. Wore it like that sometimes. The vest had to have deep pockets for storage. And then the pants. <laughs> the suspenders there. The pants were made of wool. And the pants had to be tight-fitting. In later years, Levi jeans became available. So take a look. Okay. Got the whole get up there. And he's got chaps and boots, leather gloves, and a lariat. Each piece was necessary for varying terrain or weather conditions. Now look at the title of today's lesson on page 60. Cowboys and Longhorns, the Frontier. I think you're going to enjoy this lesson. But first, let's make sure you know the meaning of the word frontier. Look it up in your glossary. And if it helps you to have a little bookmarker of some kind. I have a tab right here. That way it takes me only seconds to flip to the glossary and then find the word. So we're looking for frontier. Do you have it? Right there, frontier. Land that has not been settled. Well, that's simple. So the frontier is always changing. So once it is settled, it's no longer the frontier. It is a place that is just ahead of the settled area. So it stays in front of the masses of settlers that were heading west. So will it be, will the frontier last forever? No, it's actually quickly disappearing. Read pages 60 and 61 to find out what life as a cowboy was like. What was the open land in the west called? Mm -hmm. The frontier. So what happened to the Indians as Americans began to settle the West? Mm -hmm. Whole tribes of Indians were forced off their lands. White Americans were stealing the land from the Indians. And what does the Bible teach us about stealing? That it's wrong. Cattlemen also played an important role in the development of the American West. Acre for acre, they were responsible for taming more of the frontier than the miners or farmers. And they did so with relish and a romance that have appealed to people ever since. Let's look at the two types of livestock that were mentioned in this section. The buffalo and the longhorn. Now, how are they alike? How are they different? First, let's talk about the buffalo. What are buffalo? Buffalo large, shaggy beasts, almost like oxen, that the Indians needed to live. What did the Indians um, use the buffalo for? Let's try a Venn diagram to help us. The Indians used every part of the buffalo. They used it for food, clothing, and shelter. And what words would you use to describe a buffalo? Mm, they're hairy, they're shaggy, and they have short horns. Now, what are longhorns? Mm hmm they're wild cattle that the Spanish settlers brought to America long ago. So what did people in the eastern cities and western towns want longhorns for? Yeah, for the food. And to use the longhorn hide to make leather. And to use the fat to make candles and soap. And what words would you use to describe a longhorn? Long, sharp horns. Did you notice that both of these lists share a couple of items? Let's put the words in a common shared space. Yes, food and horns were on both lists. But another one would be clothing because leather was used to make many things, including clothing. 
So although the animals had roamed the southwest since the Spanish explorers brought the first cattle to the New World, a large-scale, open-range cattle business did not boom until after the Civil War. The peak of cowboy activity came in the 1880s. So what kinds of people went west to work as cowboys? Immigrants from Europe, white Americans, black freedmen, Mexicans, Indians. Have you thought about that? Indians as cowboys? What skills were important for cowboys to do their jobs? Well, they had to be good with horses. They had to tame wild horses for riding. They had to throw a lariat or rope around the horns of a stray longhorn. And they had to survive long, hot days and chilly nights. A cowboy was expected to bring his own tools to the job. So what kind of tools do you think a cowboy would need to be successful? It would be impossible for a cowboy to do his job without a good horse. It was usually a good, strong, fast quarter horse. And some cowboys had their own horses, but most ranchers provided horses for the cowboys. Extra horses were taken along on the cattle drives, and they were cared for by a wrangler. But a cowboy usually had his own saddle, and he often used it as a pillow. So look at the different parts of the saddle. Some you know, and others may be new terms. There's the latigo, a heavy, durable, specially tanned leather strap used to connect the cinches to the saddle rigging. There's the horn, the seat, the cantle, the back jockey, the skirt, the fender, and the stirrup. Two other important tools he needed to be skilled with were his gun that he uh, used for hunting game or shooting rattlesnakes. And so he really liked the Colt 45. It was the preferred tool and became popular in 1836. Some of them carried a rifle, but this was the preferred tool. And then a lariat was used for roping a steer. A lariat could be stretched around trees to make a corral. It could, could drag firewood or pull a steer out of the mud with it. And since cowboys had to be able to throw a lariat around the horns of a longhorn, he also had to know how to tie a lariat. So if you have some rope, I'm going to show you how to make a lasso knot, okay? I have the, the examples here, okay? And first thing you know how, how to do is to tie an overhand knot, okay? Just like this, put it through. It looks like that. See, look at the picture, just like that, okay? That's going to become the stopper knot. And then you do it again, another overhand knot. Put it right through. It's going to be a little looser. Okay, looks just like that. Now, here's the tricky part. Make it look like a pretzel, okay? And pull this end of the rope through the right side of the pretzel, okay? Hold on to the knot, and you have a little loop here, okay? Hang on to that, and tighten up your knot, okay? And this is called a Honda knot. Okay, this is the kind that they used on the lariat. And then you take the end of your thing, pull it all the way through, and that's how you make your lasso, okay? So is this how you rope a cow? It's a little too wimpy, and that's why a cowboy used a stiffer rope, a lasso like this. And look at the Honda knot right here on the end of it. So you can see why a lariat and the stiff rope is necessary to make a lasso. Now, if you looked at the picture on page 61, you could see that the cowboy is riding and trying to lasso a longhorn while he's riding the horse, and that takes a lot of skill. And all of these skills were honed so that they could be, uh, they could successfully help with the cattle drive to get the longhorns to market. Early cattle drives headed west to the California gold fields in 1850, where a cattle were worth five to ten dollars a head in Texas. But they could get twenty-five to a hundred dollars per head all the way in San Francisco. So at a pace of ten to fifteen miles a day, most drives to California took five or six months. But once railroads became more reliable, cattle drives headed to the towns where train stations were and loaded the cattle on the trains. And depending on whether they'd encountered any delays or not, the drive to Kansas would take between 25 and 100 days, really cutting down the travel time. And that way the cattle didn't lose weight in that extra travel.
I want you to read pages 62 and 63 to find out what it was like to drive cattle to market. The most important part of a cowboy's job was the trail drive. Getting ready for the drive took careful planning. The ideal herd size was 2,000 four-year-olds, and a rancher set out to gather the herd in the early spring. With so many cattle grazing freely on the plains and often getting mixed up with the cattle of numerous owners, ranchers had to develop a way to distinguish between cattle and who belonged to who, and their solution was branding. You know what a cattle brand is? It's a special symbol on the hide of a longhorn. What was the purpose of them? Hmm? The brands helped cowboys know whom each longhorn belonged to. And they heated a specially designed iron rod until it was red hot, and then they applied it to the cow's side. And the branding iron made a permanent mark on the cow's hide. Wow, that's a big brand. Now, when the ranchers rounded up the cattle before driving them to market, they separated them according to the brands. And ranchers tried to come up with a unique and interesting brand designs that were not easily altered by rustlers or thieves. So I toyed with a couple for Walker. The W has feet for walking. And then there's Lazy Walker. Maybe you could add some snoring to it. Or Crazy Walker on my head. But you don't want to get too complicated because the bigger the brand, the more surface area has to be burned. So, ouch! So you might want to try to come up with a brand for your family. Brands were designed to be simple and small. And cattle brands helped the owners identify the steer that were roaming the western plains, that they belonged to them, and foil the would-be cattle rustlers. Now, cowboys actually carried a brand notebook that had all of the local brands so that they would, could keep track of how many cattle belonged to each rancher. And there were many members of the cattle drive team. So what did the trail boss do? The trail boss, who was paid around $125 a month, was in charge of the cattle drive. And his responsibility was to get the herd to market safely. And about eight cowboys were hired to work the herd at salaries ranging from $25 to $40 a month. Two of them were point men, two of them were swing men, two flank men rode beside the herd to keep the stock from wandering off, and one or two drag men would bring up the rear, riding in some choking dust that they had to uh, keep any of the weak or tired stragglers moving along. A wrangler was usually the youngest of the hands and was paid the least. He took care of the horses and the riding gear. And the outfit was accompanied by a cook who hauled the chuck wagon ahead of the herd. He got food ready for the tired crew at the end of the day. And the cook's day could start as early as 3 a.m. and sometimes lasted until midnight. The drive started at daylight and went until sunset or even later if the trail boss could not find good grass or water. And after dinner... The cowboy's work was still not done. They had two, um, four two-hour watches at night. So pairs of riders would circle the herd, riding in opposite directions on guard for any signs of trouble. Because cowboys hated night riding, not only for its loneliness, but also because of the dangers. Almost every stampede, the most frightening and dreaded experience cowboys faced, started at night. A snap of a twig, a strange smell the flight of a nervous jackrabbit, or a bolt of lightning could set off a stampede. You know what a stampede is. It's when the herd gets frightened and runs away from the trail, and they scatter. And if they couldn't stop the stampede quickly, the cowboys faced several days of gathering up the scattered herd in unfamiliar territory. And even worse, cowboys could be crushed to death by the herd if their horses stumbled and fell in the dust. So to keep the cattle from stampeding, the cowboys often sang at night to calm the herd. Songs that the cowboys sang around the campfire, such as Goodbye Old Paint, Clementine, Red River Valley, You Are My Sunshine, Billy Boy, or Whoopie Tie Ya Yo. Maybe you've sung some of those. Do you know this song? <laughs> As I was a walking one morning for pleasure, I spied a cowpuncher strolling along. His hat was thrown back and his spurs was a jingling, and 
As he approached, he was singing this song. You'll be die, I oh, get along, little doggies. It's your misfortune and none of my own. Die, I oh, get along, little doggies. You know that Wyoming will be your new home. It's early in springtime, we round up them doggies. We mark them and brand them and lob off their tails. Chug wagons to get them their doggies out on that long trail. You'll be tired, I hope. Get along, little doggies. It's your misfortune and none of my own. Did you sing along? You know, sometimes the words are different because they were passed on by singing, and they could change the words depending on their circumstances, or even because they forgot the words and they made up their own. That's why you might hear three or four different versions of the same song. Now, what other kinds of things did cowboys do to relax? They had contests, told jokes, told stories, sang songs. So does a cowboy's life sound glamorous and exciting, or does it sound like lots of work? I think it was a hard life. In fact, the era of the cattle frontier was brief. By the early 1890s, most of the cowboy legends had passed into history, leaving only the dress and the songs to be copied and idealized by modern Americans. And in the 25 years that cattle drives flourished, 40,000 men drove 10 million head of cattle over a network of trails, and most of these trails led north from Texas. But seldom mentioned is the fact that almost one-fourth of the cowboys on the cattle drives were African Americans. Pictures of the period and artwork by artists show faces of young men. It was a rowdy, rough life. And booking and arrest records show that most cowboys were under 20. So the term cowboy was a fitting one. Young cowboys spent a few years riding the range or trail and then usually married, settling down as farmers or ranchers. I still love to read westerns about the life of cowboys or former cowboys that rode the trail. And we'll talk next time about how the cattle trails and cow towns and the lawmen that were brave enough to try and tame the wild, wild west came into being. Now let's take a look at the activity manual page, page 27. We're going to match the, cat, the uh, vocabulary here that we talked about and answer the questions and Mark all the correct ones so you know that there's going to be more than one answer for some of them. So what was our big idea for the lesson today? The life of a cowboy was a rough one, yes. And cowboys had to, do, had to have a special set of skills to do their jobs. Do you remember what they were? They had to be good with horses, tame wild horses for riding, throw a lariat or rope, and survive long, hot days and chilly nights. They had to be prepared for their jobs. The trail boss counted on them to be reliable and to be alert. How do you think they learned that? Well, if you listened, you heard that some of the cowboys on the trail could be as young as 12. I'm sure they learned some things the hard way, but they learned fast or they were not allowed to go on the trail. So what can you learn from this? Hmm. You're never too young to do your best. Mm -hmm. And there are many verses about that. 1 Corinthians 9.24 says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. 
And then Proverbs 3, 13, 4 says, The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. And one more, Proverbs twenty two twenty nine. Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. So find out what is expected of you and do your best to meet that goal. It is a life skill to be able to discover what your boss wants and to do it. And as a Christian, it is important to learn to do your best in all things, not for your glory, but for God's.